So okay. it's going to be pretty special. Hopefully we can all go to it. And uh, it passes pretty close to Tulsa. So we're going to go down and probably to southeast Oklahoma where everybody else isn't going. <laughs> oh, there you go. There. <laughs> well, that'll be an event you'll remember with the special birthday. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And, and he saw the uh, Ring of Fire in, in Albuquerque in 2012 when he was about 13. So I'm going to try to get him to go if he can to the one in October. But the thing is, I'm going to try to double dip and go to this Okie Tech's in September and then go right back to it, stay there for a few days with a few well, friends, kind of make a sec. How far is it away? Uh, a pretty good percentage uh, down there? It's about three hours away from the center line. Yeah, I mean, three or four hours. So I'll have to yeah. get up pretty early that morning yeah. and drive to wherever it's clear along there. But again, I won't have the problem you had, Terry, of the, you either can't get a room or they've jacked them up to you know, 400 bucks a night or whatever. Oh, and yeah. I, I encountered that just within the last couple of weeks as I was doing a little searching. Yeah. yeah. It's what amazing. What kind of prices did you find, Carol? Well, I found a good deal in Arkansas, believe it or not, in the Scotts home state. Uh, oh, really? really? Oh, you know, that's, great. I, I, that's a good place to be, I think, Arkansas. It's, it's fairly a, it's favorable. It's a town of 2,000 and mm -hmm. a resort, and they're, they're wanting people to come in. So. All right. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. like we're about and besides, to get... we have uh, what four uh, minutes and seventeen seconds at that location, as opposed to one of the major places southern, uh, further south in Arkansas that has slightly more than three minutes. The ones that are getting hyped a lot, so yeah, that's a no brainer. Yeah, yeah, but comfort, comfort, and ease makes a big difference. I don't mind giving up maybe five or ten, maybe even fifteen seconds of totality. For comfort. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I'm, we're looking at a place in uh, not too far from Uvalde. Uh, I've got a hotel room there at the, what's the name of the, anyway, it was reasonable and they haven't jacked up the rate, at least not yet. Is yeah. that for the annular? Uh, no, that's for totality. Totality. That's so good. It, it's near, that's it's good. in Southern Texas. They're unaware. Oh, good. Yeah. So hopefully, I mean, it's supposed to be a decently clear part of the path, but yeah. I got a good no feeling No guarantees either Arkansas. way, of course. No guarantees. Yeah. Yeah, who true. knows? I just don't, hopefully none of us want to be driving on Eclipse morning. No. Yeah. It not be yeah. good. But, yeah. You right. know, Ohio has a very high chance of clouds. Texas doesn't. And I was with one of the um, library people looking at the site they want to use, and making sure they could see it from there. And, you know, on April 8th, when I was there at, which will be, <laughs> I could see the, if it would have been the day, I would have seen the eclipse in Ohio and I would have been clouded out in Texas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the way that crazy <laughs> stuff works, you know? I know. Yep. I looked at the cloud cover in Texas as I'm standing right there where I would have seen it in Ohio and totally cloud. Well, you out. know, and in, in uh, Casper Alming, we had gone to great lengths to make sure we chose the best one, best location possible with adequate lodging and so on. And I'll be darn it rained the night before the eclipse. So yeah, it can happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it's there's no guarantees. That's what I keep no. telling everybody. Just do what you can do, but there are no guarantees. Just you know. Make the best even when, it, even when it is clear, as it was for the 2017 eclipse for us in western Nebraska, it was perfectly clear, but the drop in temperature caused an increase in the condensation above us. And so clouds formed not long yeah. before totality. Oh, yeah. I thought, oh, no. no. <laughs> uh, oh, but wow. we were able to still see almost the whole eclipse, but it was a scary feeling that last, you just saw the clouds forming right above and it was just because of the temperature drop. Mother Nature just had to tease a little bit there. At the oh, end, I guess. <laughs> as if it wasn't enough, you know, everything <laughs> up to that point. Yeah. You know, the preparation, the driving. You know, I went to Aruba for my second eclipse. I was at Baby Beach, Aruba. Oh, yeah. Woke up to pouring rain, looking <laughs> out the windows at the hotel. The cruise ships were all docked in, and I'm going, oh, man, I'm going to miss it. And we went ahead and drove out to Baby Beach and set everything up in the rain. We sat in the rain, and yeah. 10 minutes before it started, it totally cleared off, and we got to see the whole thing. Oh, wow. I, I was amazed. I was wow. great. <laughs> yeah. That's as close as you could come. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. Um, I guess, Scott, I'm going to answer you in a minute here. All right. I think we are ready to go whenever we're already live. So, Scott, go ahead and start the <laughs> Right before auroras dance in the sky, there's often an appearance of a mysterious shape. It drapes across the sky like a glowing pearl necklace. Scientists call them auroral beads. Structures like these can reveal how Earth's magnetic field interacts with solar material gushing through space. Understanding these interactions better could help scientists protect low Earth orbiting satellites from extreme solar events. But until now, how the beads form has been a mystery. With the help of NASA satellites and computer models, scientists have the first evidence of how auroral beads form. All auroras are created when charged particles from the sun are first trapped in Earth's magnetic environment and are then funneled into the atmosphere. But scientists are now realizing that small changes in the magnetic environment can cause big differences in how the aurora can look. To analyze the auroral beads in more detail, scientists took observations from NASA's Themis mission. Three of the Themis spacecraft study near-Earth phenomena that triggers auroras. Scientists then combined Themis observations with ground measurements and powerful computer models. This is the result. It's a simulation of the near-Earth environment that scientists can analyze on scales from tens of miles to 1.2 million miles. They found that when particularly large streaming clouds of plasma from the sun reached Earth's magnetic field, they created buoyant bubbles of plasma behind the planet. Just like a lava lamp, the buoyancy between the bubbles and heavier plasma creates fingers of plasma about 2,500 miles wide that stretch down towards Earth creating the distinct pearl necklace structure in auroral beads. From the ground, the beads average about 30 miles wide. Scientists hope these models will also be able to explain other small-scale structures seen in the auroras. The new results show us that even small, short-lived events within auroras can be linked to big global phenomena in our near-Earth environment. Well, hello everyone. This is Scott Roberts from the Explore Alliance and the and Explore Scientific. Uh, we are back with the Astronomical League, uh, their Astronomical League Live program. Uh, this time with uh, who is it uh, going to be on this time, Terry? Uh, we've got Bob King, Astro Bob. Great, great. And Carol, and Brad Young, and you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I haven't seen David yet. Yeah, and we are, I guess we're expecting David Levy, um, but um, uh, at this point, I think um, maybe uh, it's best just to go ahead and get started, and um, yeah, so. All right. Turn it over to you, Terry. Thank you, Scott. Well, as some of you might have heard, we were all discussing the solar eclipse and plans and what everything looked like, so uh, You've got kind of a heads up on what we were all thinking. So thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate you being here. Uh, it's a beautiful Friday night. It's raining in Ohio. So <laughs> kind of typical. <laughs> kind of used to it by now, but wishing it would go away. So Carol, how about if we start with Carol Orr? She's the president of the Astronomical League. And Carol, I will let you take it away. Well, thank you, Terry. And I wish you would send some of that rain my direction because we don't get anything here. So I guess if I could, I would, believe me. <laughs> it's great to have everyone uh, on tonight. And I'd like to go ahead and talk a little bit about Alcon 2023. And I'll share my screen. Okay. As most of you know, we uh, are 
have scheduled Alcon 2023 for July 26th through the 29th in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. This is the first time we've been in Louisiana for many years, if ever. I don't think we, looking back in the records, we've ever been in Louisiana before. But we're really uh, looking forward to it. In addition to some of the speakers we show here with David Iker, uh, Fred Espinak, David Levy, we also have the Vatican astronomer there and just one of many that we will be having there at Alcon. So I would encourage you to not uh, stall any longer, put your reservation there now, and you can have get more information uh, at, uh, sorry about that, uh, at astro, uh, alcon 2023org So make sure you get that in there now. Okay, one of the speakers will be uh, Fred Espinak, like I said earlier, and you'll have a special presentation on Thursday evening. I encourage you to sign up for that. It's a special planetary show. This is what the hotel looks like on the exterior. It's a classic hotel, been around a few years. It's a very uh, neat place. And it's yeah. just a few miles from the grounds of the Capitol, maybe one or two uh, miles, if even that. So it's a very uh, walkable situation. A uh, lot of history there on the Capitol. Uh, Huey Long, uh, uh, his uh, uh, tomb is there on the south uh, uh, grounds of the, of the Capitol. So lots of things to do in Baton Rouge. Anyone out there who has just recently received your Master Observers Award, or maybe got it in a previous year, but who has not had a, a position of the plaque yet, I would encourage you to... Uh, I give that as another reason for signing up and registering for Alcon 2023. We like to recognize our people who uh, uh, receive that pinnacle award, the Master Observer. And at Albuquerque, this is the picture from Albuquerque last year. And we had uh, like 14 Master Observers get their plaques in person. So we'd like to have a repeat of uh, a big number of folks. And if you, when you register, there's a section and the registration that asks you if you're a master observer, first of all, and then if you are a master observer, to list your number and if you received your plaque. And uh, we would like to uh, set that up if you haven't received your plaque. It's a, uh, it takes a ton of uh, time involved uh, out there under the night skies to make this happen. So we really want to recognize those people who do that. And I think I'll quit sharing my screen now. And speaking of master observers and people who have done a ton of observing and who are active in, in that sort of thing, I'd like to introduce now Brad Young from the Astronomy Club of Tulsa. Brad is currently vice president, I believe, and he is one of the major organizers of the Mid-States Regional Convention of the Astronomical League, scheduled for uh, June next month in Tulsa, the Tulsa area. And in addition to Brad being an organizer for this convention, he is also a longtime supporter of the Astronomical League, including your master observer, I'm sure, aren't you? Uh, I'm actually uh, platinum. That's what I thought. He's, he's not only a master observer, he's gone to the highest level you can get as a uh, master observer right now. So he's really set the bar high for other people. <laughs> <laughs> and in addition, how many uh, observing clubs do you are you the coordinator of now? Several, I know. Well, it kind of depends if you count the levels. Um, there's, a, I have done at least seventy, and then you know if you count where there's multi-tier awards of each club um, or or program, then it's over a hundred. Yeah, imagine that that many, and that's about that's getting up there very close to having all of them. <laughs> I'm getting, addition, I'm getting there <laughs> slowly but addition, surely. <laughs> uh, you're one of the coordinators as well, aren't you? Still, uh, uh, several uh, programs from the league that you're coordinator of. Yes, I'm coordinator for the um, Earth Orbiting uh, Satellites Club, also the uh, Alternate Constellations Club, and our program. And then just recently, we've started a. Speaking of solar eclipses, we've started a solar eclipse. Right now, it is a more of a challenge. It's listed as a challenge on the website. We're hoping that we can convert that to an observing program at the next, at 
at uh, Baton Rouge yeah. uh, when that goes before the, the council. So hopefully that'll happen. But either way, I would encourage everybody to do that. Uh, you obviously don't need to sell that one very hard. Um, <laughs> there'll actually be there'll be an award for each one, they'll both the annual and the total. So look at that on the website, see if you're interested in doing it. And even if you're not interested in doing the observing program, <laughs> go see the eclipses. That's right. <laughs> well, Brad, I won't uh, take any more of your time. I, I tell us what we need to know about the MSREL 2023. Okay, let me share my screen real quick. And just um, let me just do one thing, and that's correct correct you just a little bit. I'm not the vice president of the club. I'm actually the uh, observing chairman. Uh, Don Bradford is our vice president. Very, very capable guy. And I don't want him sorry. to. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> You've been in all the offices at one time or another. And I, 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 <laughs> I got to hold the wrong memo. <laughs> no problem. Um, anyway, as uh, Carol just said, the Astronomy Club of Tulsa is happy to host the Mid-States Regional Conference or Convention of the Astronomical League um, in Tulsa. I hadn't been in Tulsa for about 20 years. I think I went to the last one. It was in 2003 um, when I first started doing Astronomical League observing programs. So uh, the, my whole history of doing all those programs is, is condensed into the period since the last time we had it in Tulsa. So we're happy to do it again. Um, obviously, you know, all of this stuff is available at the website, msral2023.org. So any of this that you miss or if you want to see more information or register, which you, you can certainly do, uh, that's at the website. It's June 9th through 11th, and it's in Jinx, which is a suburb of Tulsa. Uh, we're going there because their high school actually has a planetarium, and a lot of the presentations and obviously the, the planetarium show will be uh, in that planetarium, it's a very nice facility, and I encourage everyone to to attend. Uh, we have a quite a, a collection, a slate of speakers. Um, the keynote speaker is Dr. Daniel Kenefic. Um, it's his topic is multi messenger astronomy, uh, history of this still dawning field. And to be honest with you, I don't really understand too much about this field. Uh, this is, has to do with gravitational waves which is, you know, right over my bald head, um, but I'm sure it'll be an interesting <laughs> talk nonetheless. Uh, Fred Gassard is gonna talk about uh, a, a, an area that, that his club had, I'm trying to remember what it's about, that I don't remember if they had an observatory there already or if they built one, but they ended up getting, um, getting it darker than it was before and now it's a much more usable facility and he's going to talk about how they did that uh john blazy is actually from a nearby city uh bartlesville which is about 60 miles away he's going to talk about dark sky parks and obtaining your ida certification and then byron levity is one of the guys in our club he's going to talk about when he had the opportunity to go to chile and um, do the ambassador pro educator ambassador program there, which he was extremely happy to attend, and he'll share that with you in his presentation. And then you, I can't see his name real quick. Let me move this little thing. Val German is going to do his talk on astronomy on the Santa Fe and Oregon Trail. Hmm. And then cool. the next. Uh, Presentation is actually co-presenters, Brad, me, and John Barentine, uh, who some of you may know because he's very active in the dark sky efforts. Uh, we're going to co-present on that program, Alternate Constellations. He's going to talk about absolute gr groups of stars and uh, constellations, and he's actually written two books about that topic. Um, so let me just grab them real quick. He has written a screen sharing off. Oh, actually, now I'll have to do that. Do that in order to get the camera on. There's one of them, the Lost Constellations. I realized it's a mirror image for you. But, and then you can probably guess which uncharted constellation that is, if you can see the head with hair made of snakes. <laughs> and I'll go back to the presentation. And 
Then we have John Moore, who is actually the vice president for planetary occultations for IOTA. He's uh, going to talk about chasing shadows, the exciting world of, world of occultation sciences. And I have heard a rumor that he may be, uh, for those who are interested, he may be sharing some useful hardware for that purpose uh, to people who attend. And we might have a little lottery or some kind of giveaway up above the door prizes that we're going to have that'll have to do with that talk. And then Dan Zielinski is our planetarium director. He's going to do a planetarium show on the eclipses. I'm sure he's going to basically give you a preview of how it's going to look in the planetarium. And then Peggy Walker, who is the Astronomical League STEAM and Junior Activities Coordinator, will do uh, Once Upon a Time in MSRAL Part 2, which is a continuation of her sort of look back at what the uh, what the area has been doing all these years, you know, past conventions and past past exciting things that we've accomplished, that sort of thing. And I believe that's the last slot. Now there's one more thing. Oh, how can I forget this? <laughs> uh, there's a new mobile observatory that's recently been completed, Explorer One, you see it there. Uh, it's gonna be at our convention. Uh, it's gonna be sort of the first big, um, in live in-person type thing that they're going to do uh, they've been testing it for quite a while and they're ready to go it's equipped with an 11 inch celestron inside the little dome and it's also got a 70 millimeter uh, max 2 h alpha scope for the sun which you know most of the convention is going to be doing in the daytime so they have it set up for that and if they have if we have cloudy skies which i hope we don't they have a dedicated hotspot. They're going to uh, hook up to a remote telescope and, and show how those things work, which I personally enjoy using those quite a lot. So either way, it'll be exciting. And what I didn't put on the slide was part of, you'll see this on the agenda if you go to the website, part of the convention is that uh, Friday night, Saturday, if it's cloudy, uh, we will go out to our observatory, which is about 30 miles further on out of town. And you can see our setup there, our 14 inch telescope, our dome, which has been newly, the, the uh, mechanism for turning it's been newly installed. We have new handrails, a bunch of new improvements to it. Um, so I encourage everybody to go out to that tour. And we'll have some telescopes set out on the field. Uh, like I'm going to set mine up and a few other people so you can do some observing while you're there. And that's the end of the slideshows where I'll stop sharing and hope that everybody will um, come to the convention, especially, you know, obviously the people in the Mid-States region, but anybody that wants to come to our convention, you're more than welcome to. So uh, visit that website, msral2023.org, and we'll see you there. Sounds like a fun time, uh, Brad, and uh, get your uh, registration in now. And uh, now back to Terry. Oh, thank you. Well, Carol, I'm sure you will be there enjoying yourself. Yeah, I finally Looks at like the last minute got my registration in a few days ago, so I'm I'm all set. Looks like a lot of fun. Uh, you know, you've got some excellent speakers. It'd be interesting to hear all the topics. So everybody, check out the website, sign up, and head to talk to what was it, Jinx? Yeah, Jinx is just outside of Tulsa. Yeah. Okay. And, head uh, out and all the hotel, it, there's quite a cluster of hotels around that area. Uh, we have, you know, uh, deals. If you mention, you know, it's all on the website, but if you mention you're going to the convention, you'll get a break on that. Uh, we're not actually inside a hotel like um, looks like the National Convention is, but it's they're very close. Um, it yeah. won't be any problem to get back and forth. And if anybody needs to be shuttled back and forth, I'm sure we can. You can find somebody to help you with that, or if you need a ride to go out to the observatory. So just let us know. Well, it sounds like a good time. So thank you very much, Brad, for coming on. It's nice to meet you. All right. Well, Bob King is coming up next. Um, we had we're for, we've known Bob for a while. He has been on. He's always such an excellent speaker. Bob, I'm going to read your bio. So uh, Bob <laughs> King fell in love with the night sky and astronomy, astronomy when he was a kid growing up in Illinois and loves to share his passion with people of all ages. He writes for Sky and Telescope's website and magazine and maintains the Astro Bob Astronomy blog, which is excellent. Check that out. 
His books, Night Sky with the Naked Eye and Wonders of the Night Sky You Must See Before You Die, describes the joys of star of sky watching, while urban legends of space examine science versus Pluto science in astronomy. Pluto, uh, pseudo, I'm sorry, pseudo science in astronomy. Bob wants to see everything he's read about in astronomy books, with the <laughs> exception of falling in a black hole. Uh, yeah, Bob, we don't want you to go that way either. <laughs> but it would be interesting to see, wouldn't it? To see the black hole. So, Bob, we were talking about Aurora, and Scott had a really great uh, Aurora video on at the beginning. Um, it was cloudy here, but we have really seen a lot of activity on the sun. Um, and hopefully, I mean, the Aurora reached clear down. How how low did it go? Mexico. On, Mexico. I wow. heard I heard the Mexican border, and then I saw a photograph on space weather that was made in Florida, northern Florida. Oh, it showed wow. a little bit of red, you know, kind of reddish glow time exposure. Yeah. So it really, I mean, it dipped down there. Yeah, and if it did it once, and it's getting more active and more active, hopefully it will do it quite a few more times, so everybody can get a chance to see the aurora at some level or another. Um, but I tell you, I even the last time I was in Alaska, it was so incredible. You can tell there is so much more activity and so much color, motion, everything. It has just been spectacular. And you living up north like you do, I'm sure you have had some excellent views yourself. Yeah, we uh, and I'll show some pictures in the presentation, but uh, we don't have corona auroras very often you know where they all yeah. the rays come together and pivot near the magnetic zenith in the sky uh, but we had one month after another of corona auroras and it had been some years before that so yeah. uh, i love when i look at the sun and i love seeing the regular rotation of sunspots when i see the big ones starting to roll off <laughs> so far in the past year and a half there's always been new ones to come on and replace them so yeah it's just been a continuous merry-go-round of sunspots so i'm optimistic we'll also get some more great auroras that yeah. will go right down to your house terry it so you better to... yeah yeah yes, it better <laughs> <laughs> yeah i noticed there is a huge sun sunspot group right now on the back side of the sun that yeah. you know will possibly be rotating around if it sticks together so bob's bob i'll let you tell the topic or the uh, title of your talk. I will be quiet and let you start. <laughs> so thank you, Bob. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry, for that very nice introduction. I appreciate that. Well, uh, we are going to talk about the aurora, and there will be visuals, obviously, but the focus of my talk tonight will be more about sound, whether we can hear sounds from the aurora. And indeed, there are at least a couple of ways to hear sound for sure now as it appears. And we're going to explore some of those ways that we can get the Aurora to make some sounds for us, so to speak. So I'll go to my presentation, share my screen, and we'll start up. And it's called, well, I had a lot of titles, but we'll call it, Can You Hear the Aurora? And the answer is a qualified yes on that. And what inspired me in part to talk about this topic was the fact like Terry and I were describing, there were just some amazing auroras. This was my front yard back on March 23rd. Wow. I had the camera on a tripod and normally you would see some light pollution in the Southern sky. I'm looking South in this image with a very wide angle lens and a continuous flashing of the Corona Aurora I just described overhead was it was unbelievable. It was almost strobe-like in its effect. And I'm sure, Terry, you probably have seen similar auroras in Alaska. But again, they're, this type of an aurora is a bit uncommon in Duluth. That's beautiful, Bob. Oh, wow. And there were, oh, thank oh, you. Man. And there were just one corona. I mean, there were so many iterations of the corona. It was mind-boggling. I mean, at, at times you wanted to practically cry because of how spectacular it was and how it the emotion you felt looking at all of this color and action right overhead. 
Uh, this was from the following month, April 23rd. I was a little north of Duluth, where I live, and this was a full blast all on coronal display that virtually filled the sky. I mean, it was overwhelming. So uh, just one more example of the lights. And of course, it got me thinking about sounds. And I listened during both of these big displays, the 23rd of March and April, to see if I could hear anything. And honestly, I did not, even though it was brilliant and there was lots of motion. Uh, and to this date, I have yet to hear any auroras. And I've seen at least at least a couple hundred of auroras over the years and no sound yet, but perhaps conditions weren't right or I wasn't listening closely. We'll find out. Uh, I just want to start here by going back to where auroras originate really, which is on the sun. There are all kinds of interesting explosive events that occur on the sun. Uh, but the ones that really affect the Earth in terms of the aurora are these coronal mass ejections that can be caused by flares or these filaments uh, of hot hydrogen gas suspended in the sun's atmosphere. These filaments are ejected explosively outward into the solar system. And what they are are made of particles, basically electrons and protons. But the interesting aspect is that embedded within these clouds of plasma that flow away from the sun at a million miles an hour or more embedded in there is a magnetic field so as that cloud works its way towards the earth the cme uh, if the magnetic field that it carries with it is pointing downward or south that's really great because earth's magnetic field points upward or north and just like a north and south pole of a magnet, if you put them close to each other, they will attract and snap together. So in this particular configuration, south meets north, the field lines join up. And so the sun's energy and particles are now linked to the Earth's magnetic field. And the first thing that happens is some of that material is funneled down into the atmosphere, the polar atmosphere on the day side of the planet, where you can't see the northern lights, obviously, daytime. But much of it goes around the backside. Those are the connected field lines in green there. They are blown back behind the planet to the night side of the planet. Here you can see you're standing here in the dark part of the Earth, the night side. And when those field lines connect behind the Earth, that is a powerful burst of magnetic energy. And the electrons and protons from that CME are slingshotted right down along those field lines at very high speed. Uh, by the time, and they're powered by different things in our magnetic field, including something called alphan waves, which is a fairly recent discovery. These things really accelerate electrons down those field lines. And the field, the electrons naturally follow the field lines because that's what they do. Just give them a push and they'll be on their way. But it's amazing how rapidly they come down towards the polar regions. We're talking 44 million miles per hour, which is about a tenth of the speed of light. So that's a lot of energy uh, in that solar wind material accelerated in the near Earth environment in our giant magnetic bubble that we call the magnetosphere. So they come down and they strike the atmosphere at very high speed and they form a little beanie cap over both north, uh, kind of the polar regions of the Earth. Uh, the beanie caps or auroral ovals are centered on what's called the geomagnetic pole. And those pole, the geomagnetic pole in the northern hemisphere is located way up towards the top of Ellesmere Island, Canada. So you can kind of get a sense of that here in this image. And when those particles strike the atoms of the atmosphere, there's a lot of excitement. Um, they increase the energy levels of those atoms and when the atoms relax, and we're talking primarily oxygen and nitrogen, when they relax, they give off different wavelengths of light, different colors. Oxygen is very 
prolific in its colors. Uh, in the lower part of the atmosphere where the aurora forms, and we're talking about 60 miles high or so, uh, there's the air is enough so that the oxygen gives off green, which is kind of the primary color we see the northern lights. Farther up, the air is so thin that oxygen can give off red light. So you'll often see in pictures that the bottom of rays of aurora will be green colored because you're seeing excited oxygen in the lower part of the atmosphere and the tops will be red and that's the reason why. And you also get blue from nitrogen and then if you mix blue and green and red, uh, you can get overlapping colors and different hues besides the primary red, green and blue that most of us see in the Northern Lights. And this is another example. This is a Corona Aurora back from April 23rd. You can see the greens in there wow. and also kind of the red colors from the oxygen too in this uh, spectacular starburst pattern. Of course, this was very brief. This pattern is pivoting, moving because these particles are flowing in so rapidly uh, down the Earth's magnetic field lines. And it's like, it's almost like watching a motion picture. They're moving that rapidly. Now, in addition to visible light, that's what we've been talking about so far. When those electrons and protons come crashing down, come flying down along the field lines, they also give off radio waves, uh, not just visible light. And the particular kind of radio emission that they give off is called very low frequency here on the left, VLF. I'll refer to it from now on as VLF. Here's the visible spectrum. All right, the very familiar, there we are, just a little slice in the grand electromagnetic spectrum. The short, powerful stuff is on the right there. And as you move leftward, you get through the infrared, which is the domain of the Webb telescope, and then through microwaves in your microwave oven, AM radio, and then way down here, you're at very low frequency radio waves, so low that the waves are 20 to 60 miles long. So that's a big, long old wave. Wow. That's what's being produced during the Northern Lights, which obviously you can't see, but there are ways to hear those radio waves. Uh, a familiar producer, a very potent source of uh, very low frequency and also even beyond that ELF or extremely low frequency waves is lightning. It happens all the time. And that energy, those waves, they go out into the ionosphere and sometimes as far as that giant magnetic bubble around us, our protective shield, the magnetosphere. And then really interesting things start to happen. This is a diagram kind of showing you how storms, lightning storms produce VLF radiation, radio waves, that then bounce around the ionosphere up to about 60 miles or high or so, and then they come down to Earth and bounce around. The ionosphere is almost like a, a duct in your house that would conduct air from one part of your house to the other. So the ionosphere uh, ducks those waves. And at any given moment, there are, this is unbelievable to me, but it's true, like 2,000 storms, thunderstorms happening around the planet. So there's lots of lightning. And so there's lots of VLF radio waves bouncing through this ionospheric duct. And if you have any trouble, diffi any difficulty <laughs> visualizing a duct, I, I have one right here for you. So the ionosphere <laughs> acts sort of like your uh, air duct uh, in your basement to conduct heat back up to the uh, upper part of your house. Now I've got some examples using a special receiver and I've got it right here. I'll have other photos of it, but you, there's a little receiver here which picks up uh, VLF waves from the ionosphere and beyond, you know, up to the auroral heights and beyond. It picks this up and then you just plug in your headphones like so and they're plugged into the receiver and you can hear these things routinely as long as you're away from an AC power source, because this device will also pick up the loud hum that AC power makes. So if you're out in the countryside where you're away from these sources, you can begin to hear some of this music, I'll call it, created by things happening 
in our atmosphere and on the ground, such as lightning or the northern lights. And here's just an example for you. You're going to hear static and something called tweaks, and together they're called spherics. And I hope you guys can hear that. Give me a thumbs up. Okay, the sound is working great. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, what you're hearing is the staticky sound, and those you know who had a car back many years ago and listened to AM radio on their car radio, you're familiar with the static that lightning causes. Well, it causes a similar static when you listen to it in that low frequency. The tweaks are something a little different. It's the radio waves from lightning going out into the ionosphere and traveling like around the whole planet and then coming back to you. And during that travel, the radio waves become dispersed so that the high frequency ones arrive before the low frequency ones. And so the tone, instead of a little click, becomes more like a longer tone called a tweak, almost like a, a metallic sound. Well, this is even cooler. And you're probably wondering, why am I talking all about lightning? Well, in learning a little bit about lightning, it will introduce us to what the northern lights sounds like through one of these devices because whenever you're listening to the northern lights through that receiver i showed you you're also going to be hearing spherics you're going to hear tweaks and so forth but among the more interesting spherics are whistlers and here lightning generates vlf waves radio waves that go not just through the ionosphere but they go all the way out into the magnetosphere like an earth diameter or two away from the planet and then they're ducted back just like that duck work you saw back down to the planet to your little receiver and because of that long long journey the radio waves are dispersed even more than you hear in a tweak and they become a very long tone that starts high and goes low and it's called a whistler so let's listen to a whistler Can you hear that, guys? Okay. And well, that was a good one. Right? So those are whistlers. And that's basically that, again, the waves, the energy that's created by lightning going all the way out there to the to the auroral zone and beyond to where that material starts rushing in from the sun once we make that magnetic connection. This is a device and there's the headset for you to see. And I'll have more details about the device in case you're interested in buying or building one at the very end of the presentation. So I've gone out and this is how you use it. You just walk out there when there's Northern lights and half the time I forget to bring it. I'm always cursing myself. I'm like, oh, because I'm usually bringing a camera or something else. I'm like, oh, you forgot the receiver. So you hold it up in your hand, you point the antenna to the sky. It's good to be in an open area. And when you do, you get to hear what's called the dawn chorus. And it's, I just, the, I've heard it either as birds, it's almost like when the birds sing at the start of dawn, but often it sounds like frogs to me, at least the frogs that are around here. So we'll give a listen. I've got two, two of them here. These are not frogs. You can hear some static. And this can go on. For, and sometimes you hear these long hisses and then these descending and rising tones, but most often this is what I've heard. When you take the headphones off and look around, it's absolutely silent and it's a bit disconcerting. You're like, because well, you feel like you're standing next to a pod. This is energy created by those electrons that are colliding with the air above you and creating these beautiful displays. It also creates this lovely chorus of sound. It's real sound. It's just electromagnetic waves that are going to convert it to sound, just like what your ordinary radio does when you tune into music. So let's listen to another. 
by version. This is a different recording. There's a tweet there. There's some tweets in the background. I know some of you would probably want to just sit there and listen all night, <laughs> but we'll keep moving on. But I wanted you to get a sense of the things that we can hear when we use radio. So the Aurora is always talking, so to speak. You know, when it's out, you can listen to it when you've got the proper technology, a device like that. So you can tune into VLF. The other half of the sound that aurora, auroras make, or maybe they don't, uh, involves several different hypotheses that people have come up with, especially in the last 50 years or so, to explain something that so many people have heard. I've looked into the research on this, and people have been hearing the Northern Lights for centuries. It's been going on forever, really. There's accounts that go way back to the Greek days, ancient Greeks. So this is something that is very common to humanity. Myself, I used to dismiss these reports thinking, no, just because I'd never heard the Northern Lights and because I thought it was our imagination creating the sound. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. But it turns out that there are potential sources for real sound that we can hear. One of them, which is not real aurora sound, is synesthesia. This is where some people, and it turns out I'm among them, can actually hear motion. If something moves in my brain, I hear a sound. Uh, it happens instantaneously, I hear a sound. There are also, we'll also explore here, electrostatic discharge like when you touch a doorknob after you've walked on a carpet, that can potentially create the Northern Lights. At least some people think so. And then there's electrophonic transduction, which we'll get into in a moment. And finally, there's a really good recent area of research where true sounds have been recorded uh, and also sounds that you can hear. Many people have heard these sounds and recorded them uh, called the inversion layer charging. And that is the most fascinating aspect of all, in my opinion. So as I said, people have reported, this is just a small variety of the different sounds that have been reported crackling and popping and swishing and whooshing. And I just, I wish I could hear such things. Maybe some of you have, I hope so. And what's interesting about these sounds is that in some cases, certainly, we're talking about synesthesia, where people see something moving and associate a sound with that movement. So I've got a little experiment for you guys to try. I'm going to show a clip here. It's just an animation, and there's no sound to the animation at all. But I wonder if any of you will hear the sound and be able to hear what this person is saying in your head. So this is our synesthesia exhibit A. Do you hear Spock saying anything in your head? Even if you don't hear the words, if any of you hear a sound, if you put a sound there in your head involuntarily, you may have a touch of this type of synesthesia. If this one doesn't work for you, let's try the next one. Too cute. <laughs> so maybe some of you can actually hear that dog bark. I know I can. It doesn't sound like a barking dog, but I'm hearing sound. And afterwards, when I'm finished here, maybe we can touch on that a little bit. Maybe some of you can share your experiences. At least I hope so with our synesthesia experiment. Well, people have been, scientists have really looked into this. And one of the first researchers that really got into it thick and heavy was Professor C.A. Chant. He was an early 20th century Canadian astronomer. Uh, I believe he was a past president of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And he looked into all of these reports that he was hearing of a rural sound, all of these people describing hisses and the sound of flowing water or 
you know, crinkling pieces of paper together or aluminum foil rattling. There's just so many different descriptions. And he 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 just didn't he didn't think so many people could be dishonest or trying to, you know, put him on. So he really thought that there was something to this. And one of the leading ideas at the time that he helped to develop was the aurora because of its say magnetic and electric fluctuation when we see the northern lights we're seeing that light we're hearing those waves through our receivers but at the same time there is a lot of activity electromagnetically there are powerful magnetic currents electric currents that are happening overhead and chant thought that perhaps these electric currents which are aided by the solar wind might cause objects on the ground to become electrostatically charged. Other people at the time thought it was a reasonable idea. Some others challenged this because they their measurements showed that even during strong auroras, there, there was not much electrification happening near the ground level. So the, the data was incomplete and sometimes contradictory. But at least Chant, as it will turn out, Chant was kind of on the right path. So if you want to know what he envisioned this as, it's, again, like touching a doorknob, where you're all charged up. You've got extra electrons on you because you rubbed your feet against the carpet. And then you reach for that doorknob, which is a conductor, and those electrons just go racing into the metal. And they do it and leave a spark there that unforgettable spark. We've all done this before and touched the knob. The other aspect of auroral sound that's been investigated, especially regarding meteors, uh, there have been a number of researchers in the United States who have studied meteors and have brought out microphones and VLF uh, radios and picked up sounds from meteors, and this is called electrophonic sound. So instead of something electrified far away affecting things on the ground, what happens in this case is when a meteor flashes, the hot gases, the plasma, that streak that you see, that's ionized air, there's magnetic fields all twisted and bundled up in that as well. When they straighten out and the ionized atoms return to neutral, they release a big burst of VLF radiation, which can induce an electric current in objects near the ground. So what's good about this idea is that a meteor could be 30 miles away, 40 miles away. So you can see it and at the same time hear a sound, which is often reported. People report popping and hissing sounds from giant fireballs. And that makes sense because it takes so little time when you're traveling at the speed of light, you know, with a VLF signal to reach to the ground from the meteor. This works with meteors. It's been proven and recorded during the 1999 Leonid meteor shower and also by another scientist during another Leonid shower, I believe 2001. So this is true. However, no one as far as I could tell, has actually recorded electrophonic sounds from the aurora. So it seems more theoretical. Uh, it seems plausible, but I have not been able to find any recordings or any definitive evidence of such. But if you do go out and you happen to be in a place where there are pine needles or there's some aluminum foil or maybe some thin wires, and even better, I hear that people with frizzy hair among the best transducers, among the best pickups for electrophonic sound from bright meteors. So here's some of the questions, okay? Before we take a look at uh, one of the better uh, hypotheses that explains the rural sound. Rock sound, people claim they can see the aurora. As it flashes, I hear a sound at the very moment that it flashes. And most reports are like that. It's not, there's never a delay. It's always, I see it and I hear it simultaneously. But we know auroras are 60 miles high, at minimum 50. And there's very little air at those altitudes. So not only is the sound extremely weak, if any, but in the best case, it would take five or six minutes for a 
big burst of northern lights to register a sound. So this seems unlikely. The electrostatic sound, there's a lack of evidence that electrical fluctuations in the high altitude auroras can actually produce sounds on the ground, but in meteors, it, or pardon me, uh, skip that part about meteors, but there's a lack of evidence for auroras. Uh, I was getting ahead of myself. When it comes to electrophonically induced sound, where the VLF burst makes something charged, you know, on the ground, we have recorded it in meteors, but weekly, uncertain results with the aurora. And that's that brings me to a Finnish researcher. Uh, he is over at the, or is a professor emeritus now at the Aalto University in Finland. And he has done a lot of research in acoustics and magnetic storms. He was inspired to study auroral sounds when he and a bunch of friends went up to Northern Finland, to Lapland, and they went to see a musical performance. And after the performance was done, they went outside. It was this perfectly cold, still night. He said, let's stop and listen. And when they did, he and a number of other people heard the aurora because there was a big aurora out at the same time. So this was his inspiration to really start researching what is the origin of these sounds that so many people have talked about across the centuries? This was his first attempt back in the year 2000. And what um, Unto Lena is his name, the researcher, what Unto Lena did was set up three different very sensitive microphones to record the auroral sounds. And three, that's an important number because with that number you can triangulate where the sound is coming from and also the approximate altitude of the sound so this is him setting up on a lake and he has done a lot of his research here in a town little town way out in the boondocks in finland called fiskars in case you wanted to know so that's the location for where many of these sounds uh, certainly the ones that you'll hear this evening come from there he is getting the mic set up there on a frozen lake out in the open. He tends to use either lakes or really big fields. He told me, he and I did a lot of corresponding on this, and he told me that uh, he likes open fields away from trees. Because my first question was, when I heard the sounds, was could that be popping from trees? You know, when it gets really cold, the sap will freeze in trees, and it will split the wood when it freezes and make a popping sound. But he was able to identify the source, and it was not trees. So here's his microphone set up. He's got three direct microphone, two for reflected sound waves. And using this setup, he discovered something really fascinating, that the auroral sound sources, his recordings, were picking up sound at an at an altitude or a height of 70 meters, give or take, which is about 230 feet. So we're not talking all the way out to the Northern Lights, but just close by. And that would jive with many of the reports where people say, I saw a bright flash, and then simultaneously I heard a sound. Well, if it's occurring only 70 meters from you, you would hear it pretty much simultaneously. So here's, one of his first sounds that was recorded, and this is the only one really that you can find online, and that's why I contacted him. And I said, do you think for the Astronomical Week, you would be willing to share more of your sounds? And he really thought about it, and he says, as long as you promise just to share it with the Astronomical League. And I said, I promise, Unto, I promise. And so he shared more, but this is the first one, this one you can find online too. You're like, what is that? Did you hear it? Yeah. It just sounds like a clap, doesn't it? Or to me, it reminds me a lot if you took two pieces of wood and you slapped them together, just like that. And I thought, how could, when I first heard this, I thought, how can this be the Northern Lights? It just doesn't fit with the swishes and the whooshes and everything else. But we'll explore that in just a moment. He found although he's recorded it in other seasons, his best recordings have been a calm, cold night 
fairly cold temperatures, minus four to minus 20, pretty chilly. And the sound is simultaneously simultaneous with the aurora. And I asked him, I said, well, great, you've got recordings. Can you hear it? He says, if we're not talking and we're deliberately really quiet, he and the others around him have heard these very same sounds more faintly, but he's heard the same sounds that you'll hear in these recordings. So here's some more examples. Uh, he's got lots and lots, but I was only able to get three more. <laughs> so enjoy them. Uh, here's one. Start here. So that's the same clap sound played three times, as you can see on top. Here's another. Let's try that again. And then here's a different one. Oh, no, oh, it's not. Oh, darn, it's not correct. There it is. Let's do that one again. And again. So those are some of the examples of the sounds that he has recorded. And after much research and many recordings, and also working with the Finnish Meteorological Service to, dis to find out and confirm what the atmospheric conditions were at the time, he has put forth a hypothesis to explain these sounds and he calls it the inversion layer hypothesis and what it is is that on a very cold night you'll sometimes have this happen the warm air will rise from the ground upward and the air very close to you will drop in temperature so it becomes super cold and then above you there will be a warmer air layer that's why it's called the inversion layer because normally it would be warmer at the ground, colder above, but here it's colder at the ground and warmer above. And what happens when it's calm outside and it's cold, especially, the conditions are just right for this inversion layer to form. You can see an inversion layer. You probably have seen this, and he provides an example here. You see this little house here with the chimney smoke? If you're out on a night where you see the chimney smoke go up a certain way and then spread out horizontally, that means that it's reached the inversion layer, ideal conditions for the Northern Lights. So have a fire off to the side when you're out there observing the aurora. Anyway, what happens is that the negatively charged ions in the air rise upward with the warming air towards the inversion layer. Meanwhile, the positively charged ions above the inversion layer are raining down towards it. So you can see, we're setting up kind of a charging situation here. This is becoming more positive over time. This is becoming more negatively charged over time. And those charges are strengthening during the night. How do they get together and combine? What makes, what makes them cross that border? It turns out, at least according to his hypothesis, that the geomagnetic storms that occur cause a great loading of electrical and magnetic currents way high up in the atmosphere. And they act as a switch to finally load this layer with so much positivity that the two combine and they make a spark. It's almost the same thing as when you touch that doorknob again. There's a little spark that goes off. And that spark is like a very miniature version of lightning, which creates a tiny clap sound or a crackling or a crunching sound. So maybe this begins to make more sense why those are recordings of aurora. Of course, they're not really aurora, are they, per se? What they are is sort of a combination of things happening at the same time. The, pro the proper weather conditions, uh, a geomagnetic storm overhead, and very quiet conditions. And you have those put together and there is a possibility that you would hear sound. After reading this and seeing this hypothesis, I'm now more convinced that next time or any time I go out to see the Northern Lights, I'm really gonna make an effort to listen before my hearing goes totally bad <laughs> because 
I may have mistaken some of the trees I thought were cracking for these charges coming together and making pops and crackles during some of these Northern Lights displays. So if we look at the sky, you can see the light from the Northern Lights. They are part of the whole geomagnetic storm process. So the lights themselves cannot be directly heard, at least according to Untolanus hypothesis. We're not hearing the lights. They're just part of the whole package, aren't they? They're the visual display. And it's those variations above us, you know, the great storming that's causing, that's acting like a switch to bring those two opposite charges together and make those popping sounds. And it's really fun. We talk a lot about science here and we, we often seek scientific explanations for the Northern Lights and rightly so, our curiosity drives us to ask questions and try to get to the bottom of things, you know? Why are we hearing these sounds? How, in what ways is it possible to hear sound like this? But I still love to go back to the Inuit legend. So hundreds of years, and for all I know up to the current day, the Inuit people of far Northern Canada, they think when they see the Northern Lights and they hear the sounds, what they're seeing are the souls of their deceased ancestors and they're playing a game of soccer in the sky with a wall. Can you see it here? That's a walrus skull right there. So they're kicking around the walrus skull. So however you like your Northern Lights explanation, if you prefer to just fall back to the walrus skull, that's okay too. It's just uh, a fun, a different cultural way of looking at a phenomenon that we would uh, normally investigate scientifically. And with that, I will, I think that's my, this is my final slide I had mentioned earlier, but I give you the information about this in case you were interested in finding a unit or buying a unit. It's called the WR3VLF receiver. It's built by this guy, Stephen McGreevy, and he used to sell them from a website, but now he sells them off of eBay on occasion, and that's where I got mine. You can also go to NASA's INSPIRE project, which has a lot about VLF. And it also, I believe there's a kit there and instructions that you can get to actually build your own VLF receiver if you want to try to listen to the Northern Lights. So this is just a little bit of information and a link for you to check out if you want to get to find out more information about VLF and possibly getting a receiver. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that because, you know, there's been many times I've stood outside and honestly, you know, have you ever been where the snow is so frozen? If you listen to any video I've taken in Alaska, all you hear is my foot stomping, my feet yeah. stomping yeah. in the snow and it cracks so loud. Um, so, you know, and most of the time I move in from camera to camera, it's hardly ever quiet around me because I am moving. So that is very interesting to me if I would just stand still or kick back and lay in the snow and watch it and have one of these receivers or just with my ears. That would be really just with your ears. Yeah, just yeah. with your ears too. Is and, and I um I'm I'm usually I'm like you, I'm very involved, you know, I'm I'm looking and I'm right. taking pictures and I did make a deliberate effort to listen, but to really listen, you have to decide that's what you're going to do. Yeah. Because if you really listen for five minutes, that's probably not enough. Right. But if you if you make listening the same as, say, observing the phenomenon, I think your chances would increase, you know, to yeah. hear it. And yeah. he's I've, I've asked him, I said, are you sure? Have you heard have you heard this? And he has said that he's heard it many times. And people who have done research with and it has been confirmed. I know there's been a, some Japanese scientists have also conducted ex yeah. similar experiments. So I think it's yeah. really exciting. Uh, it may not be directly caused by the Northern Lights, but it's all part of the same phenomenon. You know, this yeah. vast phenomenon that extends multiple Earths out into space, right down to the ground and literally into your heart too. 
right. seems yeah. spectacular display. Yeah, and you know, there's many times too. Sometimes it's kind of like an eclipse. You really just want to kick back, and it is so beautiful. The structure yeah. of the aurora, the motion, whether it's fast or slow, but to watch that structure and everything just kind of grow and move, it, it is amazing sometimes just to soak it in. Yeah. You don't know, worry about yeah. imaging or whatever, just soak it in. And that would probably yeah. be when you might possibly hear that sound. And my next trip will be in March. I definitely will make an attempt at this. Oh, that's great. So, yeah, yeah. You, and you're going yeah. where you're getting a guarantee of a major display. He notes that uh, he has recorded it in a number of major displays. However, I said, have you ever listened to it without any big auroras? And he has said, he's confirmed that that does happen sometimes when there's an auroral storm, but just like sometimes we don't get to see it, but it's raging up in Canada. Yeah. Then he could pick up the sounds even without any really bright aurora visible at all. So really? and that also demonstrates that it's part of a much bigger picture thing. Yeah. That's so, interesting. Yeah. That is really interesting. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. It's maybe more ubiquitous than we thought, and I think it would be great if you know more people, as many people as possible, would go out there and listen to the Northern Lights and see if we can't get more data. Really, you know, yeah, get some more. yeah, and with it being so much more active with Solar Max coming up, you know, yeah. more people might have that opportunity. So that's something to really think about. Hopefully, yeah, everybody it, watching will consider that. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a project. I'm going to make it more of my own personal project too. You know, as part yeah. of my aurora watching, and we'll see. And I suppose, I mean, there are people out there uh, in the league who are probably sound experts and have great recording equipment. Heck, you know, why not bring it out? You know, something yeah. that, and where you could, you know, something sensitive enough to at least run it and try it. Definitely. So well, you we keep us research. I mean, it's it's on the whole thing is sort of ongoing research and right. We'll see where it takes us. Yes, you keep us updated, and if I hear anything in March, I definitely will keep you updated. Thank uh, you. It would be yeah, Please that do. would be a lot of fun. <laughs> That's great. Check oh, that out. <laughs> <laughs> so, does I'm sitting here just talking away to Bob? Does anybody else have? Oh, any? sorry. Yeah. <laughs> How long has he been doing the research, Bob? Um, he, he really, he started in 2000. So I guess, you know, we're coming on getting up to 25 years and he's still writing papers about this stuff and going out and making recordings. And at first, uh, I mean, we started just, like I say, a little bit of an email thing. And then he was just so forthcoming about you know, his papers and data. And, you know, again, he shared those sound files, which were additional ones. So, so I wonder what motivated him originally to get involved with it. Oh, it was at the beginning. I had mentioned that he had went to a, a, a musical event with some friends of his back in the early 90s in northern Finland in Lapland. And when the band was done, they all went outside and it turned out there was a really spectacular display of northern lights. And he asked everybody to just stop and listen. And when they did, a number in the group, including him, heard the Northern Lights. And that's what sparked his interest. That was the beginning. That was in the 90s. And then I guess he got going in the year 2000 with, you know. How exciting. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I like how, you know how inspiration is that way it can it sort of comes out of nowhere you know some random thing you suggest to do or a somewhere where you end up suddenly can become your life you know and it did for him in terms of his research we did some of uh, the league did some collaboration with a professor uh from off the university i believe it was he yeah. was talking about music in the park and would that be a grand idea to uh maybe uh, might set up somehow with Aurora. <laughs> yeah. Uh, put the music and then uh, music, take a break and listen for the Aurora itself. That would be cool. Um, there's an interesting, that reminds me, Carol, of uh, on YouTube, you can actually find there's a, a composer, current day composer, who has taken 
those auroral sounds. I wasn't aware of this until uh, Unto pointed it out, taken them and incorporated them into a piece of music about the aurora. It's just a short piece, but it, it really works well. So he just did this on his own, obviously with permission from the professor, but yeah. uh, I don't know. That's it, a kind of a thing on the side, but fascinating. That would be. Oh, so who knows? It doesn't explain everything, does it? We uh, unless he has many recordings that you know, maybe he's got hissing recordings and whatever else. But in terms of the crunchy and the popping, we have those. At least I have those so to share. That is really interesting. You know, we've always I've always heard, you know, the question: Can we hear the aurora? I mean, ever since I first started getting interested in that. That, you know, that question has been around for a long time. To actually listen to those videos is dramatic to me because it is so sharp and so clear and crisp. Um, yeah. And yeah, so I asked him, I said, is it like, is it like lightning? I said, it reminded me of like yeah. thunder, the sound. And, and really, when it gets down to it, we're talking a spark there, right? When you combine positive and negative, you get that doorknob spark and it's a very small spark and i said well can you see it and it turns out he said that it's emits mostly in ultraviolet however it would be difficult to see anyway because it would be against the backdrop of the northern right. lights so yeah. we are talking like a spark discharge phenomena which takes us way back to that early researcher uh Professor Chant in the early part of the 20th century yeah. was suspected it had to do something at least with the movement of the northern lights with the magnetic and electrical fields, although he envisioned it as something much farther out, you know, at the aurora coming down, rather than being an activator, a switch much closer to home, because that's really what this research shows. Yeah. Yeah, wow. it's cool. It's cool. And that it, it was just uh, interesting enough. I thought, well, when you asked, I thought, let's talk about this. You know, yeah. Um, it just that's, sounded that's cool. amazing. <laughs> well, if you happen to be at Aurora Summit, and if I happen to be at Aurora Summit, we're gonna have to sit down and discuss this for a while. I uh, I think so. And I yeah. who knows, I'll bring I'll bring some new ear research, you know, with me. Yes, please do. <laughs> I would not mind checking into one of these receivers. I think that would be really interesting and fun. Yeah, so, if you want any more information, and I've got some other websites as well uh, that have been put up by the creator of the device, Steve McGreevy, because okay. he's been doing e VLF for many, many years. I'd be happy to share those with you, Terry. Yes, please. I guess please do. I would love to see any information you do have. So, mm -hmm. like I said, Bob and me could just sit here and probably here we go, go. And on and on for a while. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's yes. great. So, all right. Um, does uh, do any of you have any other questions? All right. We had uh, nice um, uh, responses from the audience. Uh, you know, we want to thank the audience that's watching from around the world. But um, uh, there were conversations about um, um, you know trying to listen to. Uh, to the uh, you know these sounds, uh, Book Davies says some resonant fraction of a v, uh, VLF signal. Hmm, another experiment. The ten meter band is hard enough. Uh, I love the presentation as a ham. Used to go to sleep listening to a sideband frequency with the squelch wide open for white noise. Oh, great. oh wow! <laughs> oh, oh! I have That's to ask cool. uh, I, before we close, whatever we close. But did yeah. anybody imagine sound or hear sound when they saw Spock talking or the dog barking? I did with there... the dog barking. Kind of, uh, imagining, imagining. Yeah. yeah. But you yeah. simultaneously with the dog. It's not like you forced it, right? I didn't think I did. It just happened, didn't it? Yeah. It, it's yeah. yeah sure. I, I think. If you well, when you watch like silent movies and they're talking, yeah, you know, yeah, you can kind of you know I don't know if you're just lip reading or or what it is or you know maybe maybe lip reading is uh, this uh, synesthesia that yeah it might be helpful if you have that. <laughs> have it. But with the dog, of course, and you could 
there's um, other uh, demonstrations of this that don't involve people at all. They're just figures that move across the screen, expand, contract, disappear. And when I watched that video, I almost included it, but it was a little long. When I watched that one, things are just popping all the time, you know, but it's sort of an indescribable sound, but it's a real thing. It's like some composers see, or when they see certain colors, you may have heard of this, they hear certain sounds. Uh, there's, I, I can't think of his name, but he's done a whole bunch of colors. One's called blue, loves the color blue. So to him, it makes beautiful music when he sees the color blue. So sometimes we, you know, our senses are not sharply defined. Uh, and in some people, there's, there's more crossover, I guess is the word I'm looking for in some of us than in others. Um, some people keep more separate, some just get them mixed, you know, and maybe to good effect sometimes. And it might, again, explain some of the observations of the aurora, especially where it's simultaneous. Big, bright ray, I hear a swoosh. That potentially could be uh, synesthesia. Well, you know what my problem is? When I see that br big, bright display or flash, I'm going, wow! You know, I know! <laughs> I yeah. wouldn't hear anything anyway. <laughs> that's the sound of the aurora. You're always right there. Oh, that's yeah. it. Yeah, it's like, oh my gosh. That's yeah, what I should have played, like Terry. It's the sound like I should have just done lots of wows. That would have been another sound of the aurora. <laughs> hey, if you're around me, that's what you're gonna hear. Wow. Yeah, me, me too. I'm the same. I, I I'm all, I, I'll you can't help it. You it's like during a total eclipse. Yes. You involuntarily call out. So yeah, it's like you do that gasp of, oh, wow, you know, it, yeah, yeah, it just happens because it is absolutely so beautiful and so rare, you know, especially yeah. with eclipse. And that's why we're all in this hobby anyway, I always figure, because yeah. um, there are, you never know when it's going to happen, but those wow moments are scattered throughout our astronomical life, you know, that. Yeah. We put ourselves, that's the thing, as an amateur, you put yourself in a situation where it could happen, and that's the key. So yep. if you're out, you got a better chance. you got a better chance at you know, seeing or hearing something you never heard before, and then that those waves of emotion you talk about, Terry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing. It, yeah. So anyway, all right. Bob, thank you. I really enjoyed that, and I'm sure everybody else did too. Thank you so much for, for being on. We enjoy having you here always. You're always welcome. So, thank you very much. Hey, Appreciate it anytime. very much. I do. And yeah, we have a good time. We we all do when we all get together and get discussing all these topics. So, thank you again. And Carol, thank you for taking time out to come and talk to us. And I thank Brad before he left. It's Scott, always my pleasure. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I, I know yeah. I'll be in touch with you too. So, Scott, thank you for all the, I know you have been crazy busy. Thank you for being here. Uh, it was so nice. It was so nice to do this and to listen to Bob's uh, very, very interesting uh, topic. And, um, I, you know, I just love all the, uh, uh, you know, the insight into things that uh, uh, that you can't think about uh, during your workaday world, you know, it's it's uh, um, it's a, it's nice to channel into the universe through astronomers that show up on the Astronomical League live. So that's really cool. <laughs> yes, yeah. we are fortunate to have some excellent speakers and excellent topics. We are so fortunate. So, and thank you to everybody out there watching. We will be back on June 9th. Uh, we will announce the speaker a little bit later. So please join us then. Yep. And Scott, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks everyone. And, um, uh, you know, I want to uh, uh, thank our audience that's watching, whether you're watching live or you're watching this as a uh, rerun on uh, one of the uh, uh, channels that we're simulcasting on. Um, if you are uh, interested in joining up with the Astronomical League, and who wouldn't, okay, uh, you can go to astroleague.org um, and uh, sign up. So, um, uh, 
you know, if you live in the United States and you live close to an astro astronomical league club, uh, you know, the easiest way is just to join that club. But you can join anywhere in the world as a member at large. And um, uh, they have incredible resources. They have uh, uh, an amazing library of uh, observing programs that you can, uh, you can do these observing programs and, and be recognized for uh, completing them. Uh, you can also get involved in nominating uh, worthy people for their uh, awards that they give out each year at the Astronomical League Conference. Um, and of course, you can go to the Alcon events, which they talked about earlier. So um, we're very honored to be uh, uh, presenting these Astronomical League live programs, and uh, we'll be doing more of them. Um, until that time, uh, you guys keep looking up, and we'll see you um, next time. Thank you.